The Boiler Upload podcast is brought to you, as always, by Reindeer Shuttle. Lafayette may be getting commercial service at the Purdue Airport soon, but Reindeer Shuttle will still take you to the Indianapolis or O'Hare Airport from campus with multiple trips per day. Just remember to go to ReindeerShuttle.com to book your next trip because, as we always say, driving to the airport sucks. Welcome everybody to the Boiler Upload Podcast. Yes, it has been quite a long time since we have had a podcast here. Casey has been going all over the country, all over Big Ten country, which will soon span coast to coast, covering Purdue basketball this year. And speaking about conferences that will soon span coast to coast, I guess the Atlantic coast does technically cut touch the Pacific coast if all water is connected. And that means we have JC Zimbal with us tonight from the North Carolina State Rivals site. JC, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. Good, good. Glad to hear that. Um, as everybody knows, I'm Travis Miller of Boiler Upload, the Rivals.com produced site. And we've got a pair of teams meeting in Phoenix on Saturday that have not been to the Final Four in a very, very long time. Um, did the three-point shot exist the last time North Carolina State made it? Because I know it did not for Purdue. So in my recollection is this three-point shot existed at 16 feet in the ACC. Okay, that's but weird. But may not have existed as a rule until, uh, what, 1987? I think you might I be believe. right. 85, Which, 86, 87. Somewhere right. in there, because that's when Delray Brooks and Billy Donovan, Delray Brooks, a good name from Indiana, yep. uh, powered Providence, and Steve Alford powered uh, Indiana and Freddie Banks powered UNLV and they were launching threes back then in that final four that uh, Indiana ended up being Syracuse. But uh, but yeah, that that's my recollection of three-point shot. But the ACC legit had like only 16 feet. I mean, it was it was probably a layup to the really good shooters. Yeah, I mean, shoot, Zach Eady could do that. Uh... <laughs> you know, Zach Eady is a 50% three-point shooter in his career because uh, one of two is 50%. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's where we could begin talking about Saturday's matchup. Uh, the big discussion is Zach Eady against uh, Burns. Uh, got a couple of guys banging bodies in there. It's going to be it's going to be interesting. How does Burns match up cuz uh, obviously he does not have the height that Edie does, but he's got the uh he's got the bulk to hang with him. Well, I have two theories on what will happen with DJ on defense. Uh-huh. Um, the first theory is, is that when Trey Kaufman's in the game, I have a hunch that they'll try to hide DJ guarding Trey because they want to avoid him from getting into foul trouble. That will lead 6'10", 215-pound Muhammad Diara to guard Zach Eady. Now, going deep cut, my theory is that when Mason Gillis is in the game, that is when DJ Burns will end up guarding Eady because they will not want DJ Burns chasing Mason Gillis around the three-point line. Yeah, because uh, Gillis has been quite exceptional this year off the bench with uh, hitting threes. I think he's shooting really close to 50%. It kind of goes up and down. He's had a rougher NCAA tournament, but I know he hit a couple of really big ones against Gonzaga in the Sweet 16 game. And that seems to be one of the big matchups there, like you said, is how do you cover Gillis when he's in there? Because that expands Purdue from three shooters out to four shooters. Um Kaufman Wren can step out and hit the three, but he does not take one very often. I think he's taken one in like the last five games. So uh, I, I like the way that you described that with uh, Burns trying to guard uh, Kaufman Wren. And then I saw you guys also have Ben Middlebrooks as your next 6'10 guy. How would he match up with Edie uh, in there in the paint? I mean, he would try. I mean, he's a physical guy. And, you know, I mean, he would try. I mean, he'll – He'll come in, he'll he'll bang bodies, you know, he'll try to do what he can. But I mean, Edie is just so tall and so big. So I mean, I don't I don't know if I don't think there's really a game plan in terms of stopping Edie on offense. I think the real game plan though is to protect DJ Burns, make sure that the guys don't get into foul trouble. Uh, maybe it means that you let um, you know, you let the big man score to live another day rather than score and, and get fouled or fouled before, you know, send them to the free throw line. So my, my whole thing is, is 
from my standpoint, from watching NC State play big men all year long, you know, if they can protect DJ, I, I call it a, like a, a, a one person zone. So, like, for <laughs> instance, when they played Duke, they didn't always want uh, DJ Burns to go against Kyle Filipowski. So they would have him guard Mark Mitchell. And basically, DJ would kind of ignore Mark Mitchell, you know, when he was out on the perimeter. And some t- in one game, Mark Mitchell hit some shots. And in other games, Mark Mitchell didn't do much. So that that's why I go back to the whole Gillis versus Kaufman deal, because I think it's it's a huge factor in what NC State will do with uh, DJ. You know, the, the rest of the matchups are, are pretty straightforward. Um, you know, Casey Marcel has been a very good defensive player. Uh, another Indianapolis native, Jaden Taylor off the bench, is a good player uh, on defense. Um, when Taylor and Marcel are in the game at the same time, that's their best perimeter defensive outlook. Um, but it's not, they don't always play together that much. They did in the beginning of the year, but um, but now it's been Michael O'Connell at point guard kind of taking over that role. And then DJ Horn at shooting guard and Casey Marcel on the wing and Jane Taylor off the bench. So, um, you know, that that's kind of how I look at it is, you know, it's hard to, you know, as you know, I'm sure you've seen it all year long. I mean, I'm guessing it's really hard to double team Edie because he just passes right over people. Yeah. And then that's, he's, he's actually learned to kind of attack the double team, at least selectively. And there has, having watched, you know, this team play 37 games now at this point, there, like you said, there really is no good way to defend him. I can't think of a single team in the country that can that would have any success trying to defend him one on one. Michigan State did it to their folly. Anybody who tried in the Big Ten who tried to do it really struggled. And like you said, the double team, he's a much better passer this year yeah. and able to kick it out to some really it, good shooters. It would have to take somebody like a Donovan Klingon, who's almost as tall at UConn. But there's just there's just simply not many players like that. And, you know, that's that's one of the fascinating subplots of the game is that these are two teams that are very able to just dump the ball into the center and let them go to work. And, yeah, no, you know, obviously for for Burns, I think he'll face up against Edie from like, say, 15 feet, um, maybe a little bit more than normal. I mean, he's not going to be able to just overpower Edie, you know, with his, I, I call it the bump, bump, bump move, where he just kind of keeps bumping into a guy and the guy keeps going backwards and he bumps into him and the guy goes backwards and, you know, and then he hits his little left hook. Every Everything with DJ Burns is about the left hand. You know, it's like a video game, you know, when he's on the right block, he turns into the middle of the lane to try to hit the lefty hook. When he's on the right block, he goes to the baseline to try to free up his left hand. And but other than teams that double him, you know, no one's, you know, it's harder to stop him. Um, but then state's never gone against that type of size with Edie. So it would be that part would be fascinating. And then the the other thing that has happened this year is teams try to get DJ tired. But, you know, I don't know how much of a I don't know how fast the pace of the game will be, but if they get him tired. You know, he it means that he usually comes out like every four minutes. And then obviously everybody wants to try to get him into foul trouble. Um, how how amazing. I saw that Edie has not fouled out once this year and like maybe four games he had four fouls. You know, what what is it about him that allows him to never really get into foul trouble? Honestly, I think a lot of it is he is very selective on defense. Um, he does not pursue block shots very much at all. He especially in the first half, he kind of goes out of his way to avoid contact and avoid fouls. But then as the game goes on, that's when he gets a little bit more aggressive depending on any foul trouble that he has. Um, You know, there have been a few games where he's had to sit, uh, most notably at Ohio State, I believe, is the one where he kind of had to sit down for an extended period of time and Purdue did end up losing that game. But uh, he knows that as long as he can avoid avoid fouls, he can stay in the game. I mean, he set for 33 seconds against Tennessee uh, to have a seven foot four guy play 39 and a half minutes is incredible, honestly. Um, so I think it's just the way he paces himself in the first half is how he does it. And then 
he saves that defense at the end where, you know, teams are just tired of going against him on the offensive end. And then he's able to have that little extra burst defensively. He had a huge block of Dalton connect in the final minute that kind of sealed the game on, on Sunday. So that's really what he has done to avoid foul trouble is just consciously not going off. He's kind of living to it, fight another day in the first half. So he has those fouls and can be more aggressive in the second half. You know, I I don't know if, if the country who watched the Tennessee game, I got the, what I call the essence of Lance Jones and Foster mm-hmm. Lawyer, but how have they been on the wing this year? Uh, Lance Jones, I will be quite blunt. He has been the difference in this team and the reason that they were able to go up another level. Um, I don't think that you could add a player that <laughs> was a more perfect fit out of the transfer portal. I mean, this is a guy that got plugged in with four starters returning from last year. He did not play a single game with them until November. And it looks like they've been playing together for four years. Uh, He is, he's an extra ball handler for when Smith goes to Braden Smith goes to the bench. He is a solid shooter. He hit a gigantic three pointer when Purdue was struggling from three against uh, Tennessee on Sunday, gave it a, it pushed the lead from three to six with about two and a half minutes to go. And really he's just, he has been everything Purdue has needed. He can drive the bell. He can play defense. He can do a little bit of everything as a guard. And then Fletcher lawyer, I think he was able to move from that two spot over to the three spot on the wing. And it has opened things up for him. He's kind of picking and choosing his spots, but he's still just an excellent shooter shooting about 45% from three and He's had some games this year where he's just gotten red hot. He had 27 points against Tennessee the first game out in Maui, and that was kind of his best game of the season. So we know what he's capable of. We know he's capable of getting hot. He could hit four, five, six threes in a game if needed. And uh, it's he really hasn't had a breakout game in the tournament yet. And it'll be interesting to see what he can do here with uh, here in the Final Four. Yeah, I think I called him his older brother who played at Michigan State and uh, Davidson. Yeah. NC State, NC State might have played the older brother when he was at Davidson at once upon a time. Yeah, but- they actually played against each other last season in Indianapolis. Davidson played Purdue uh, when Fletcher was a freshman. So they right. got to play against each other once. <laughs> now, one one thing, and I'm, I'm sure Matt Painter has been asked this a few times over the years. You know, obviously Lance Jones is one of the rare transfers he has taken. You know, is that just... I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, is he in a, a dabble Sweeney? I just don't take transfers kind of guy. Or, you know, I was looking it up. I think you got to go back to like John Octius in like 2014 is the last time Purdue had an impact transfer. Guys that have been, you know, occasional contributors. Last year, he had uh, David Jenkins Jr., who kind of was a vagabond all over the place in his college career. He played at South Dakota State. He played at Utah. He played at UNLV. And he spent his last season at Purdue last year. And he was more of a bench guy, come in, shoot some threes. And he's had a few people like that. But uh, Jones has obviously been the most impact guy that he has gotten in the portal, aside from Oct- and, you know, he, He's even gone ahead of what Octius did. Uh, Octius is famous for that dunk. I'm sure you've seen it where he murdered Colin Hartman in Bloomington in cold blood. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Jones, just an absolutely perfect addition. I don't think, I don't think everybody, anybody expected him to be this perfect of an addition to this team. And I honestly, I don't think Purdue is in the final four if they had not gotten Lance Jones. Sure. One, one thing that NC State fans can relate to with the Purdue story is that, you know, after Virginia lost to a 16 seed with, with uh, Maryland, Baltimore County, Tony Bennett, like he basically owned that press conference after that game, you know, was a textbook example of what to do after a shocking, shocking loss. And I kind of felt, you know, I didn't hear the entire press conference, but bits and pieces of what I did see that, and I'm sure you heard every word of it. Do you think Matt Painter kind of really set the tone after last year's loss? to to basically show you know the path that Purdue needs to be on by that having that kind of leadership after such a difficult loss absolutely he's always been very upfront with trying to be proactive trying to change 
And I, I have looked at him as a coach that has been very, very good about making changes on a macro level. Sometimes he's struggled with some of the micro in-game adjustments and everything, but he's very, very good about seeing what type of team that he has going into a season and getting the maximum amount of success out of that team. You know, obviously you have Zach Eady this year. You have a seven foot four Redwood in post. You're going to go through him. Almost makes a final four or five years ago with Carson Edwards as a six foot tall guard that can just shoot from 30 feet. (laughs) And he built a team around that two very, very different teams, but they were both incredibly successful. Both won the big 10 and, you know, obviously this one got to the final four. That one got as close to a final four as you can so actually get without the going. The Virginia team that ended up winning the title the next year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that this is kind of like the crowning achievement for him. And really for Purdue fans, we just, uh, speaking for myself, I've always just wanted to make a final four. I, I never wanted to get greedy and want a national championship just because, making the final four was so elusive that I couldn't even imagine winning it once there. <laughs> so the last 48 hours been kind of walking around and now I'm starting to realize, Hey, they might be able to win this damn thing. And um, living in the same state as Indiana, we am sure you hear it with North Carolina and Duke uh, five banners, championships, all that. Yeah. You at least guys, you guys at least have two of them. We have none, but it would be really nice to just hang a banner about as big as those five in Bloomington. <laughs> sure. I mean, I, I, you know, there, there are similarities in the sense of, you know, you're in a state where bragging rights are for real when you include Notre Dame and Indiana, you know, but then even the neighbors, the neighboring schools, I mean, the the history with, with other schools like Illinois and Michigan State and Michigan and Ohio State, I mean, that, that's pretty intense too. And obviously NC State has their own neighborhood, you know, I think one thing that that maybe people don't always understand about Purdue, you know, they're always have been there. Like, like there's only maybe been a few blips where they will go like two, three years where they struggle, you know, maybe toward the end of Gene Cady or, or you know, a couple of years with, with Coach Painter, you know, but they've always pretty much been there. You know, just I always thought that Purdue was one player short, different years. You know, the the Robbie Hummel, Etwan Moore, Jawan Johnson group needed just one more guy. Um, so the big the one. Lewis, if- Todd Mitchell, Everett Stevens group needed maybe one more guy. Is is that kind of been like Conzo Martin and Glenn Robinson? They needed one more guy. That kind of like been the gist. I think so. And a lot of times it's just been a depth issue. I know it was depth with uh, Johnson, Moore and Hummel. The the big what if for me with Johnson Moore and Hummel is the season, the first season where Hummel got hurt, where he got hurt at Minnesota with like two or three weeks ago in the season. That was right after point guard Lewis Jackson had finally gotten active. I think they played about seven games together as a full unit. And they were looking real good with those seven, those seven games because he missed the first half of the season with a foot injury and he was starting around into form. And then you had with him, you had four guys going and it would have been real interesting to see how that would have worked out with a fully healthy Lewis Jackson had Hummel not gotten hurt. And so that that's probably the most complete team. The 2022 team with uh, Jaden Ivey, that's the one that if I'm going to be honest, I feel like they grossly underachieved that year. Well, and it's hard to fight them that year. Yeah. And I was about to ask that question. Yeah, how how many guys were were on North Carolina State in that game? A reserve still there. And Leon Pass, and that might be about it. Yeah, maybe, let me bring it. Yeah, the box Casey score. Marcel, I think maybe Casey Marcel was on that team. Yeah, Marcel played twenty one minutes, had three points. Yeah, and I know Brian Pass was on the roster, but you know State's been a unique situation. <laughs> They've uh, they essentially have turned over the roster pretty good, but. Um, I do remember that game, though, like it was yesterday, because um, it was kind of like the highlight of the season, even though they didn't win, is that they were right there with a very good Purdue team. They should have won. They they were winning, you know, late and then kind of fell apart. Um, You know, Travion Williams went off. Well, Travion Williams had a huge game because I was looking at that box score and I was seeing what Edie. I remember Edie getting off to a good start and then 
They didn't need to play him much in the second half because of Travion Williams. And I'm sure I, I just remember the athleticism of Darian Sebron and then maybe Turkavian Smith, but definitely Sebron gave Purdue fits. And, and State's a different team this year than mm-hmm. obviously that team. Um, that team was marred because the starting center got hurt 53 seconds into the first game of the season. And then guys like Travion Williams basically took advantage of the backup centers the entire year. Everybody had their best game uh, at center um, that season. And um, it's funny how that that season really defined what has just happened in Raleigh in this year in many ways, though. Um, because of the struggles that year, State was in a, a must-win mode and entered the portal, which ended up getting DJ Burns that is is the remaining member of the portal from that first group. But they got into the NCAA tournament. That saved Kevin Keats' job. And then the problem, though, is that because they got into the portal, they had to do it again. Um, because they were they had a bunch of they took four seniors and, and DJ was like the one underclassman. So, I mean, they had to replace guys. So then they go into the portal again. So this year they had nine newcomers, uh, eight are active. What one is uh, currently uh, missing the the run because of uh, mental health issues, stepped away from the team. But they basically have eight new guys on the roster, and going into the ACC tournament, it did not look good for Kevin Keats keeping his job. Then they win the ACC tournament, that kicked in a two year contract extension. So now. They're in the NCAA tournament. There's no more issues about who the coach is. And then they just have been playing. They, I mean, there's really been no fluke about what they've done. Like, you know, they were the classic team that would kind of be competitive with everybody for about 36, 37 minutes during the regular season and the games they lost. There was like maybe five, six games where it got away in the last 10 minutes or, or never at all, like competitive, like the old Miss game, for instance. But they would always be there. Now they're winning those games that they were competitive with. You know, that that's the difference. Instead of losing in the last two, three minutes, they're winning in the last two, three minutes. So if there ever was a team that won't be afraid at all of a close game in the last two minutes and have an idea what to do, that's basically NC State's strength. You know, I guess, you know, how tested has Purdue been this year? I mean, I know... Everybody knows how many games they've won, but how many games have been like really drag out, you know, incredible tight games with say two minutes left. A couple, uh, a team that really gave them some fits was uh, Northwestern. Uh, both yeah. times they played Northwestern, it went to overtime. Uh, Northwestern won in Evanston by four. Purdue won in West Lafayette by nine. Uh, kind of pulled away late in that one. But uh, th- those were two of the just knockdown drag out games of the season. And they've had they've had some others where they were pushed uh, at Illinois was an interesting game. Braden Smith and Lance Jones each hit huge threes in like the last 90 seconds to put that game away. And it was very, very close. Minnesota uh, gave him a really good game at Mackey Arena. I think that was kind of the uh, uh, we're playing Minnesota on a Thursday night in February at home. We've got this. And then Minnesota was up 10 at halftime. So, uh, but you also have to look at just who Purdue has played. I mean, they beat Tennessee now twice. They beat them by four out in, in Maui. They beat Marquette by three. They beat Alabama by six. They beat Arizona by eight. I mean, th- they played three of the number two seeds this season and beat all of them in the non-conference. Uh, and so, I mean, just, I, I think it's amazing that not only have they been not only were they playing a difficult schedule, they won all those games. There's only been one team this year that really took it to Purdue and I think went out and beat them. And that was when Nebraska beat them in Lincoln, beat them by 16. And the way Nebraska did it is they shot 60% from three. They were 14 of 20. Yeah, they were 14 of 23 from three. Purdue didn't even shoot necessarily poorly. They were 13 of 33. You know, they struggled a little bit from the floor, uh, but you had Tominaga and you had uh, C.J. Wilcher off the bench. They were just bombing in threes all night, and you eventually reached a point of what can you do? You just kind of – you wash that game away. So I, I think that's – if you're going to just straight up beat Purdue, 
that's what needs to happen. Other than that, it's the same thing that's the, the same way Purdue has lost games is the same way it's lost in the last three years. They have struggled to shoot the three and they've started turning the ball over. That's what happened against Northwestern in that loss. That's what happened a little bit against Ohio State. Against Wisconsin, they turned it over a couple times when they shouldn't have in the overtime of the Big Ten champ tournament game. But other than that, man, if if they're hitting their threes and not turning the ball over, it's it's going to take a tremendous effort to beat them. Sure. And I do expect State to press some. Um, they typically like to do it after a made basket or especially after a made free throw. The key is obviously to get to the free throw line, which has been a little uneven for State. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. You know, you mentioned Marquette and Tennessee. Those are clearly two teams that State and Purdue have both played. Um, when State played Tennessee, it was in front of 2,000 people in an empty gym in San Antonio, 10 o'clock Eastern on a Saturday night, which made no sense for two schools that are both, you know, within not that far from each other. But uh, welcome to the net world of trying to improve your neutral court performances, I guess. But essentially, I mentioned earlier how Casey Marcel is a really good defender. He actually did a terrific job against Dalton Connect. Like, he shut him down. But the problem was Josiah James and uh, Ziegler, the point guard, they got off. So that was the the problem there. And it was like what I described earlier. State was there for probably 36, 37 minutes. But then Tennessee made enough plays down the stretch to, to do what they needed to do. <clears throat> the Marquette game was odd because they're a good free th- they're a good three point shooting team, but they went four for thirty one. So between Cam Jones and David Joplin, they just weren't good. They just could not make their threes that night. Um, so State really never got stressed against Marquette. You know there wasn't a lot of drama about that game. So. You know, it it, it just kind of shows how how different how teams can play different depending on the night. You know, it's not a best out of three, it's not a best out of five. So, you know, my hunch is that you you know teams can play each other like three times and have three different type of games, and and that's probably what you know has happened with state a lot of times. But uh, I guess one thing you know you you mentioned the gap nineteen eighty. <coughs> You know, um, was that that was what a Russell Cross era team or right after John uh, Joe Barry Carroll? Joe Barry that Carroll was on that. We're going. Yeah, that's how far back we're going. Joe Barry Carroll was on that team. Uh, mm-hmm. He was the number one draft pick uh, overall that year. And honestly, it, it, that was one of the Purdue teams that yes, they made the Final Four, but of all the times Purdue has made the tournament that's been one of the more least likely teams that broke through and honestly if we had not made it this year I would have looked at North Carolina State and been like really because Mm -hmm. Purdue just has a history of having these great teams fall short in March and then we've had to watch Butler George Mason Wichita State uh I know Syracuse made it as a 10 seed one year VCU (laughs) You know, year after year after year of these teams just getting hot at the right time and making a final four. And we're like, really, we can play well for four months and then lose our entire season in a two hour period, much like last year. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's it's just been frustrating. And I, I'm glad that we finally got that monkey off of our back. Now, state fans aren't going to understand this question, but I'm sure you'll explain it. What would message boards have been like in 1980 after going to the Final Four and then the coach leaves to go to South Florida? Oh, I, I can't tell you. I was five months old then, but okay. I, I I imagine it was I weird. didn't know if you had heard stories over the years because I, even when I read it now, 40 years later, 43 years later, 44 years later, it's amazing to me. Like, it just, like, I couldn't even fathom I didn't even, you know, I'm sure people weren't even sure South Florida even had a basketball program in, in 1980. That led to Gene Cady getting hired. And I know. And, and, and uh, this is what will blow away Pac fans. Purdue's had two coaches in, since 1980. Two. And, and the current one is a protege of the previous one, which mm-hmm. honestly, that was the moment for every Purdue fan was Zach Eady cutting his piece of the net in half and giving 
some of it to Gene Cady and hug again. That was, that's everything that we've wanted. We wanted a final. I personally, I wanted to see, I wanted Gene Cady to see this team make a final four. He deserved it. And he's 87 years old. He's 88 this year. You know, time's undefeated. You just don't know how many other chances you had for this guy. And, you know, we just love everything that he has given to this program and this university. Whenever he draws the loudest cheers because the pregame hype video mentions the home of, you know, whatever number of Big Ten championships we have at that point. And he's the one that reads the line. This is the home to 26 Big Ten championships. And everybody just goes crazy. <laughs> and they have actually recorded out him saying a bunch of numbers going forward because a few years ago when they won, I think it was the 24th one at Northwestern, within minutes, the Purdue basketball Twitter account had home of 24 Big Ten championships with Gene Cady saying it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's where we are right now is just being able to see Gene get this. This is, to me, this is Gene's moment. And everything that he has done has built to this. And I'm so glad that he, he's been, he's been with us to see it. You know, and then uh, I guess for the pack fans that are watching this, where, where they, where can we find your work? Uh, yeah, I'm at, I'm at a uh, boiler upload. So Purdue.rivals.com. We've been doing this about a year and a half. Uh, we'll have our guy, Casey Bartley on site. He has been at every game this year for us. So he's done a tremendous job for us covering everything. And uh, yeah, is that's what we do and we're all over everything we're we cover a little bit of everything we're doing spring football right now we're doing some college baseball but obviously going to the final four is our uh, gigantic story right now and we're excited for this week uh yeah. what what do you what's your prediction for saturday night i do think it will be a close game and i really do think it simply comes down to is whether dj burns stays out of foul trouble um, I think state's better on the perimeter. Uh, I don't have any like stats or anything, just, you know, just a gut instinct. I just think state can make plays on the perimeter, but you know, I'm watching Zach Eady and I'm getting shades of like Danny Manning and the miracles in 88 and Kemba Walker and UConn. I mean, I just don't know how you stop him. Like, I just literally don't know what you do to stop him. You know, you double him, he'll, he'll pass right over, you know, he, gets his position he shoots right over you know there, there's nothing flashy there's nothing special in terms of like what he does it's just he's very efficient he knows his spots he gets to him and then he makes the shot so that that's the part that that would be worrisome um you know i don't think state's going to be afraid at the moment after playing nine straight games where they know their season's over with a loss um you know, I don't know if there'll be a, a crowd difference, you know, with the game all the way in Phoenix. Um, maybe State will get the under crowd, under underdog crowd. But my hunch is, is that it really just will come down to his foul trouble with DJ Burns. I mean, State has played games where DJ's out with two fouls in the first four minutes. You know, that that could happen. You know, that that has happened. Um it's not the end of the world if DJ's on the bench, but it really takes away what they want to get done offensively. And it really puts more pressure on those guards to make shots on the perimeter. Um, I'm also curious to see how fast the pace of the game is. I don't know, you know, I don't like states this weird conundrum where like sometimes they want to play in the eighties and then sometimes they're really cool playing in the mid sixties. You know, that, that's really been the hallmark of their run is that they can kind of blend in to the game. Like, they don't, you know, they're not one way or the other. You know, it, it, it's not like Alabama where Alabama wants to play the 80s or 90s every game, you know. And so Purdue's that, kind of that way, too. Purdue's kind of that way, too, because uh, Braden Smith is not afraid to push the tempo, and I think yeah. he is going to be the key like he has been all season is can he distribute, not turn the ball over, and can he find his shot? I mean, he's come really close to some triple doubles this year. Uh, you know, and he just shot 15 assists against Gonzaga in the Sweet 16 game. So uh, that that's going to be very interesting to see. And I, I'm curious also, you talked about Alabama. I'm curious to see how they do against Connecticut because you talk well, they're about gonna run. I don't yeah, know. You talk I don't know if it will work. <laughs> 
<laughs> it almost will run. They're going to – I mean, I, I've seen enough of Alabama this year. You know, I think I've seen UConn play twice or three times. I've seen Alabama play two or three times. There, there's no secret with Alabama. They're going to – they're going to run, they're going to shoot threes, and they're going to do dunks and layups. You know, it's, I, I've never seen a team more married to the avoidance of the mid-range game than than them. It's their style. It's how they play. But They, they, they the, gave it to Purdue up in athletic. Toronto. Yeah, they're, they, they're very they, athletic. And, and, you know, Sears at point guard is is the college Jalen Brunson. You know, he he's really good. You know, and, and one day I'm going to ask Kevin Keats, I'll be like, what happened with Mark Sears? Because Sears went to Hargrave Military Academy, where Keats used to be a coach, and and they they were not on him after he left Ohio, but uh, boy, I bet they wish they were on him now. But um, but yeah, you know, I mean, I do think UConn is at a different level than everybody. Um, I've never seen a thirty zero run against a good team like Illinois, like in my lifetime, probably. I may never see that again. Um, you know, and I know the the world wants to see cling in against either DJ Burns or Zach Eady. I understand that part completely. You know, people love seeing the Giants go against each other. Um, you know, so whoever plays, if if UConn makes it to the title game, whoever they play, people are going to center. You know, love that center matchup. But uh, no, I, I'm I'm just fascinated by how it'll go. And um, you know, I, I've told people for years. You know, Matt Painter is one of the good guys. Um, you know, I was, I think there was like maybe been one scandal in 40 years of Purdue basketball, like that's it. And you got to go back to like the late eighties. I mean, there's just, is never a whiff of anything involving Purdue ever. And, you know, it, it will be fascinating to see how with the portal and NIL, like how Purdue evolves or changes or if they have to at all, but it's a different world now, but, you know, I mean, in terms of though, for the last forty years, I mean, they've they've really been the epitome of that that first class program. They just couldn't break through, and I, I couldn't rag on Purdue for not breaking through. I mean, we understand it. It's it's luck sometimes, you know, it's pure luck. But um, you know, so I mean, you know, I, I was appreciative. Like I said earlier, I mean, I thought Matt Painter really set the tone with how he handled the press conference after the shocking loss a year ago, because. Uh, you know, he was pure class. I mean, they're, they're, you know, some coaches, we know how they would react. You know, we know what they would do. Um, it wouldn't be pretty. But that, that's kind of how I saw that. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. It should be fun on Saturday. And then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens on Monday. Absolutely. Well, thank you for doing this, JC. I really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens Saturday. I know we're both just elated to be there. So, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been the Boiler Upload podcast, and uh, we will hopefully have something a little bit later this week for you. And so for J JC and for Travis Miller, I that's me, uh, Boiler Up.